Thank you. My specialty, what I spent most of my life working on, has been civil military relations. And one of the problems that I have confronted is there's far too much emphasis on control. Um, the problem is not to control the military. The problem is to create a symbiotic relationship between political decision makers and military, senior military officers. Now, let me make full disclosure. I spent 33 years in uniform, both active and reserve, starting out as a seaman recruit and ending up as a Navy captain. My son-in-law is in the process of returning from a combat tour in Afghanistan. My older son graduated from the Naval Academy. My daughter was an Army JAG. I was assigned to the Pentagon twice as an FSO, a Foreign Service Officer, once in the staff of the CNO, once in the staff of OSD, and the State Department I ran an office in political military affairs. My point in making it is simply that I think I know something about how the military works, not just from academic study, but from having lived with them and been and watched the way it worked. I have written 10 books and over 100, 12 books and over 100 articles on US, Russian, Polish, and German militaries. Um, and the fact that I learned one, one of my colleagues has actually read one of my books. <laughs> Based upon the academic research I did, trying to find something that made sense, I used a model uh, proposed by Alex George and Eric Stein, most useful. What it focuses on is presidential leadership style. And that's the thing you look at to try and make, me, make sense out of things. I used it for two books on U.S. civil military relations and one on Russian civil military relations. Now, Bush. I see Bush's leadership style from the standpoint of the military. It's absolutely critical. Bush is the first CEO we've had as a president. His model, he is the president. Cheney is the CEO. Rumsfeld, at that time when we started out, is set deaf, he's the department head. He also combines that sort of a model with a strong sense of loyalty. What does it mean? It means that Bush is dependent on who he appoints to sec death. He does not interfere in how the operations is done. If he appoints a good person, he wins. If he appoints a, a, a bad person, he loses. The, um, the problem, oh, excuse me, uh, how do you determine if a person's doing a good job? Now, here's where the real crunch comes. It's very difficult to take people out of the business world and put them into government whether it's the State Department where I spent more than 20 years or it's in the Pentagon. Why? In the commercial world, how do you decide if something is good or bad? It's the bottom line. You look for numbers. You look to see if you, are you making money or are you losing money. If you're losing money, you're in trouble. The military world is very different. It has a different, completely different culture than the business world. The whole the way I could go through the whole thing, but I'm not going to waste time on that. You can't focus on uh, military, um, you cannot walk into the Pentagon and try and impose business culture on the military world without running into very serious problems. You can't count things unless you want to do a body count. The military doesn't have a thing you can count. It's especially different when you're dealing with something with counterinsurgency. Are you winning or are you losing? It's very hard to tell if you want, what you want to do is re reduce everything to numbers. The problem that we have in, in the military is it's very difficult if you bring a sec def in who's coming from the security, from the business world, from re, re, uh, managing serial corporation, and put that person into the uh, military world, and then he tries to reorganize things from where he came from. Conflict, let me make it clear, is inevitable in the relationship between people in uniform and civilians. Resources, whether they use force or don't use force. I'm not suggesting the conflict is bad. In fact, this system is set up all over the place to, to encourage conflict. It is an integral part of the American political system. And the military accepts civilian leadership, expects it, and wants it. The problem is that when you violate military con uh, uh, culture, and you can do that, and it's, it's, if you're the senior civilian, you will acerbate conflict. The single point is that in terms of Rumsfeld is he ignored military culture. Indeed, he had disdain for the majority of the military and had very antagonistic relationship with him. Gates, who will come to later on, respect the military culture and has the military working with him. It is reminiscent of something the late political scientist Richard Neustadt said, presidential power is a power of persuasion. You can order somebody in uniform to do whatever you want them to do, and they'll do it. There is a difference if they do it thinking that they're part of the team, thinking that it's part of something that they uh, want to do, that it makes sense to do it, or if you're just simply ordering them to do it simply because you, and if you don't have respect for them. The, more, the bottom line of all the things that I have found studying both the Russian, American, uh, German, and Polish militaries, the key point is 
Do you respect them? If you respect them, what that means is you listen to what they have to say, and once you hear what they say, you make a decision. It may go their way, it may not go their way, but that's absolutely critical. Give me some examples, examples of, of Rumsfeld. He, uh, he basically ran the place as his own fiefdom. He appointed a man called Douglas Fife, and I, would not, I can't use the comments that, that uh, Tommy Frank said, he's a blank, uh, stupidest guy on the face of the earth. Um, and if you go through what Fife did, if you read all 535 pages of his book, if you can get through that, um, you'll find out very quickly that, you know, God forbid what, we have, what, we, what he was doing. And in fact, I think the best comment I found on the Rumsfeld administration and Fife came from a Russian general. The Alexander Levitt, some of you remember him. If a lion stands at the head of an army of lions, victory is assured. If a lion stands at the head of an army of asses, the chances are 50-50. But if an ass stands at the head of, the arm, of an army of lions, you can call it quits. <laughs> Here's some examples of what I mean. The 1986 uh, 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 law that was passed by Congress um, basically said that the Goldwater School or Nichols I'm thinking of, I'm sorry, is that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs is the president and the secretary of defense's senior military advisor. Rumsfeld went to, Shel uh, to uh, Hugh Sheldon, who was uh, chief uh, chairman at that point, and he said, I don't want you talking to the president unless you first clear everything with me. And Sheldon said, lots of luck, it's not going to happen. I've got the 1986 uh, Goldwater Nichols Act, and that's exactly what I will do. If I have something to say to the president, I will say it to the president. He waited him out. And what happened? He put in Dick Myers, who graduated from Kansas State. And Dick Myers was, a much, was appointed for two reasons. He was high tech, which is what Rumsfeld liked, and also because it was very clear he was not going to stand up to the chairman, uh, to the, to the uh, Secretary of Defense. 